Oh, good morning. Good morning. Happy Sunday and happy, what is it, St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick's Day today. Everybody got green on, I guess? Did you know St. Patrick was not a Catholic? He was not. No, he wasn't. He was a Baptist, amen? He was a missionary. By a young man by the name of Sukat, who was a rebellious son of Christian parents, and he was kidnapped and made a slave by some Irish pirates. And then uh, while he was serving as a slave, he remembered his stories of the prodigal son. He got saved, got born again. Years later, he became a missionary. He went back to the land where he was a slave and won many people to Christ and uh, never had anything whatsoever to do with the Catholic Church. They made him a saint, so quote unquote, years later and made a holiday for him. But uh, his name was Sukat, changed to Patricius, which is now, of course, St. Patrick's. So anyways, I got my green tie, so he can't come up and pinch me. I see that Abby is not wearing green, and she, she does not want pinched, though, so don't pinch Abby. So she'll pinch you back. Anyways, uh, of course, preachers out of town, uh, David and Gabby got hitched. And you can see some of their pictures out there. I got a slide uh, with their pictures on it on the screens outside. Or if you're watching online, you can see that after the service. Some good pictures there. But we have Brother Dave Barker here with us this morning and tonight, so you're in for a treat for them. Let's start off singing this morning. We're going to take our songbooks and turn to page 273. 273. It's just like his great love. You can remain seated for this one. We'll do verse 1 and verse 3. Drown me out here. <clears throat> A friend I have called Jesus, whose love is strong and true, and never fails how it is tried, no matter what I do. I've sinned against this love of his, but when a word of prayer here this morning. So let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I do thank you for this Lord's Day. I do thank you for our guest speaker, Brother Barker, and his ministry, the Scripture Memory Ministry. pray that you'll use him uh, in a mighty way today, that you'll speak to each and every heart during this hour and the one to follow. Be with our preacher and his wife. Give them uh, safety as they travel back, a time of relaxation together. And certainly for uh, Brother Dave and Miss Gabby, we ask your hand of blessing upon their marriage. Such wonderful servants of you, and so happy for them. I ask that you'll bless our time together today now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's take our songbooks one more time here before the lesson this morning and turn to page 38. Let's all stand and stretch one more time. Are we having some trouble with this screen up here still? I'll see if I can fix that once we get done with this one here. Blessed be the name. Again, let's do the first and the last verse.
you may be seated. At this time, we're going to have Brother Dave Barker come and do the Sunday School lesson. We met him years ago, I think it was 2017-ish, back in Mackinac City. <clears throat> we were up there for the uh, servants retreat, and we saw we were at the park there getting doing some pictures with a bridge in the background like we try to do every year if it's not raining. And here we saw a couple other people who dressed like fundamental Christians, amen? And we thought, well, they must be servants of the Lord here for the servants retreat, which they weren't. They just happened to, happened to be there the same time we were. We got to know them and have had them here, of course, several times. So you know them. Uh, we love them. We're glad to hear from him today. Brother Dave Barker, you come and, and do the Sunday School Hour. I'm going to try to fix that TV. Yeah. All right. Good morning. Oh, come on. Take two. All right. Good morning. Good morning. That's much. I know you're in Michigan. It's cold and all that good stuff, but we got to get you going to get that blood circulating. Amen. 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 All right. That's a little better. Just because pastor's not here doesn't mean you don't say amen. All right. Anyway, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having us. We always enjoy coming here. And most of all, thank you for praying for us. We really appreciate your safety. We've already done over 5,000 miles this year. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much for your safety. Uh, my wife is with me as always, and she will be in charge of the back table. We invite you to stop by there. I'll be advertising the books in the morning service. However, I want to mention something. I've been mentioning all three services. We have demos on the back table. They're, they're laminated. They say demo on them with the prices. Those books are not for sale. Those are demonstrated books that stay on the table. We have the paperbacks in the bins that we will get for you for sale. So please do not pick them up and take them home with you thinking, oh, I could take this one. This is a nice one. No, those are our demos, okay? So you know. So I just wanted to mention that, okay? Because sometimes we have trouble somebody walking away with one. So thank you so much for that. Also, uh, we have something special going on today. By the table, there's also a prison display. Tonight, you don't want to miss the next exciting episode. It will be prison night. We're going to be telling prison stories tonight. Everything's going to be all about the prison, so you don't want to miss that. And we'll be talking about that display and some of the other things about me working at the prison and how God used the Word of God to bring inmates to the Savior now to Jesus Christ. So you might want to tell your friends about that. Stop by the table there. I'll try to be there to explain things if you want to look around a little bit. It's kind of neat. There's even a cartoon character picture of me that was hand brushed without me being there. Airbrushed, I should say, without me being there back there. So if you want to see me in cartoon character, <laughs> there you go. Anyway, if you have your King James Bibles, please turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. At verse 15, familiar verse to a lot of people, but how much have you thought about it? 2 Timothy 2, 15. This was one of the first verses that I memorized, but little did I know how valuable it would be when I started thinking about the verse and how I've applied it to my life through the years. Study to show thyself approved unto Pastor Rogers. Is that what it says? Study to show thyself approved unto the preacher man. Is that what it says? No. It says, study to show thyself approved unto who? God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This morning in Sunday school, I'd like to talk about rightly dividing the word of God. Rightly dividing the word of God. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll begin. Heavenly Father, I thank you again for this opportunity. I ask, Lord, that you open the hearts and minds of these people, that they may behold wondrous things out of your law, that they hear you and your word and not me. I need your wisdom, strength, and power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I put together this message because I believe you are ready for the next level about memorizing Scripture. Now, in the morning service, we're going to go back and do the basics, but for a lot of you people here, you've been Christians for years. You're involved in ministries and so on. But this right here, I think it's important to help you understand one of the reasons why you need to know your Bible. Not just Brother Cook, not just Brother Chase, you know, the professors around here and pastor, but you need to know your Bible. Notice the verse says that we are supposed to show ourselves to prove unto who? God. 
One of the reasons people can't memorize Scripture is they're doing it for the wrong reason. They're doing it to be approved by their teacher. They're doing it to be approved by the pastor or even by the preacher man or to get a certificate or some kind of an award. Well, all those things are wonderful, but wait a minute. Are you doing this for the approval of your Savior? The one who died for you, the one that gave you eternal life and left you here on a special mission. I never forget, my dad was teaching on the rapture and I asked my dad this question. I forgot how old, must have been about maybe 11 or 12. I said, Dad, I said, how come God doesn't take us home right after we're saved? Why don't we just go to heaven? Wouldn't that be neat? <laughs> and he said, oh, that's a very good question. He said, the reason why is we're all left here to serve the Lord. And everybody has a special ministry. Of course, we're all supposed to tell us about the Lord Jesus Christ. But each one of us have, he said, a special job. And he said, I believe the Lord has got a special ministry for you. And you need to get prepared for it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> he put that in there, of course. So this morning, we're going to talk about this. The first thing we see here is the Bible has the answers not man. Let yeah. me say that again. The Bible has the answers, not man. We're living in a day and age where man think that they have the answers. And you have to be careful because some of the use of the Bible, we'll give an example of this in a minute, but the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 verse 8, Beware lest any man destroy you for philosophy and vain deceit. After the traditions of men, at the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. Ironically, the middle verse of the Bible, Psalm 118, verse 8, says this, It is better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in man. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 5 says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Wow. And then Proverbs 19, 21. I love this because right in the middle of this passage, you get this verse here. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. And then you got the guys that think they're big shots because they have a fancy degree. You ever heard those guys on the radio, you know, and they talk about how wonderful they are and all that? Well, the Bible is a verse for them too, by the way. Psalm 62 verse 9 says, Surely men of low degree of vanity and men of high degree are a lie to be laid in bounds, for altogether they are lighter than vanity. Now, I'm going to give an example a little bit this morning about what it would be like if I was one of these Bible teachers that had a fancy degree but had my own philosophy trying to convince you that you don't always believe exactly what the Bible says, but you can add to it. Are you ready? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the radio broadcast of I Have a Vision. Yes, I have a vision. Oh, the Lord gave me a vision many years ago. Oh, the Lord gave me Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, 2, which says, And he said unto me, Write the vision, make it plain upon the tables, that they may run that readeth. Oh, the Lord gave me a vision. And I'm here to give you some of those visions today. Men, did you know that you are supposed to wear suspenders with your belt? The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10, two are better than one for they have good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. Born to him that's alone when he falls, for not another to help him up. And all you that have dogs, oh, precious dog lovers, I love them too. But did you know that if you have a dog, it's biblical to have a son in your yard that says beware of dogs because the Bible says in Philippians 3, 2, beware of dogs. Oh, yes. And by the way, if you're wondering why the Lord sometimes does not answer your prayers right away, the Lord gave me a vision about that too. I was reading Isaiah chapter 6, ladies and gentlemen, and I saw this verse in the same year that King Uzzah died. I saw the Lord standing there high and mighty, lifted up, and his train filled the temple. The Lord's up there playing with his model train set. And Gabriel's up there with them. And Michael the Archangel. And I'm sure Peter, James, and John are helping bring, laying them off the cars. So if the Lord doesn't answer your prayer right away, well, maybe now you know why. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to give you a special offer. If you send me $50, $50, I'll send you a hand copy of the book I put together, The Visions of the Lord, with my autograph on it. Just $50. Can you imagine how much money I make if everybody in here gave me $50? <laughs> yeah, it's not familiar, doesn't it? Yeah. The sad part about it, ladies and gentlemen, is that some people fall for this stuff. They believe this. 
Why? Because they're not checking things out in the Bible. One of my pet peeves, I don't care who it is, whether I talk to a normal person, a man with a doctor degree from the theological cemetery, notice I said cemetery, I always ask this question, where in the Bible does it say that? You say, really? Yes. I don't care who it is. I don't care if they're telling me the truth or some kind of way off thing I know it is. I always ask this question, where in the Bible does it say that? It puts them on the spot. They have to give me a chapter and verse for what they believe. And it's about time we call them on the carpet. At the prison, I did this all the time. And the inmates will say, preacher man, why do you do this? Well, I say, you expect me to give you a chapter verse when I give you something, touche. And they go, well, you got it there, preacher man, uh-huh. I'll never forget one night, I'm not kidding, this happened. I was working four to 12, so they put me in a tower and I was enjoying myself. Matter of fact, I happened to be writing some of the Bible quizzes that are on the table, you know. And I, I'm there and this officer named Joe Grace, bless his heart, he was an older fellow, a Christian man. And he happened to be listening to the radio to Dr. So-and-so like I was telling you. He was all excited. He came up and he was what, doing what you call a tower check, you know, making sure everything's in order, my law book's right, and make sure everything I need is there. And he says, oh, preacher, man, you won't believe it. I heard on the radio, you know what's going to happen? I said, what's that? The Lord's coming back in the spaceship. <laughs> he was serious. And I started laughing. He said, preacher, man, this isn't funny. This is real. I said, I, said, I heard it. Is the Lord's coming back in the spaceship. And I said, do you believe all this? And I said, tell me something. What passage did he use? He goes, let's see. I think it was somewhere in Ezekiel. How about, I said, how about Ezekiel chapter 1? He said, that's it? I said, well, let me tell you something. Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10, and then you go to Revelation chapter 4, they all harmonize. And I told him what it was all about. And he started getting really, really embarrassed as a preacher man. He said, I fell for all that. I said, you sure did. I went on to explain to him, you check things out in the Word of God. I have learned one of the advantages of memorizing scripture, especially topically, is that when you talk to somebody, if you know your Bible, it doesn't take long to figure out, number one, what religion they are, but number two, what you're going to say when it's your turn to talk. It's important. I learned this over and over again. My dad taught me this long before I got to the prison. You need to be two steps ahead in this day and age, especially. You got to be two steps ahead of them. Otherwise, they are in the driver's seat. And if they're in the driver's seat, then it's all over. You know, they're, they're, they're dominating the conversation. Especially at the prison, that's the way it was. But I'm telling you, the Bible has the answers, not man. The inmates used to ask me, preacher man, what religion are you? And I would say, I don't have religion, I have the Bible. Amen. And some of the inmates that didn't know me looked at me like, kind of, Huh? The inmates that knew me would say, stick around when he starts quoting all the Bible verses, you'll figure it out. But a lot of them wanted to understand the difference between religion and the Bible. And I started to tell them and they began to understand this. And I'm telling you, you need to know the difference between what religion is and what the word of God is. You need to know your Bible, not religion. You don't tell people, well, I believe this because my church believes just because the pastor says so. You say, because the Bible says so. And I'm sure if Pastor Roger will hear me right back here saying, amen, amen, amen. It's important. It's very important. So the Bible has the answers, not man. Now, number two, the Word of God does the convicting, not man. May I repeat that? The Word of God does the convicting, not man. If there's one reason why you need to study to show yourself approved unto God, this is it. Now, I'm going to make a statement. This is in my book, The Bible Way of Soul Winning, to make you think. Now, I've been saved since I was eight years old. Can you believe I'm going to be 69 this July? I can't. Pray for my wife, okay? She's, she's already got a nursing home all picked out for me. Just kidding. But seriously... I was raised in a preacher's home. I've been talking to people about the Lord a long time. I worked in a prison for 18 and a half years, and there was a day went by I could talk to somebody. I've learned something. If you're not using the Word of God, you're getting in the way of the Holy Spirit's work. You say, what? Can you please explain that? I sure will. Who's the author of the Bible? The Holy Spirit. 
Who convicts the heart? You? No. The Holy Spirit and the Word of God does. We have been taught, little by little, I saw this come out in the 70s, and I'm seeing it, it's, it's not as bad as it used to be, but it's still there. That high pressure salesman soul winning thing that you think you have the power to win this person to Christ. You don't. Amen. The Word of God does it. And if you'd only understand that, you'd spend a lot more time using the Word of God and explaining the Bible to them as trying to tell them some tear-jerking story or try to scare them out of hell with your wits and your fancy illustrations. There's nothing wrong with those in this place. But what I'm saying is that I have found through the years that the Word of God is what does the convicting. The Bible says in Psalms 19, verse 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. Think about that. Jeremiah 23, 29. It's not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, like a hammer that breaketh a rock into pieces. Luke 24, 32. And they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us when he talked us by the way, when he opened unto us the scriptures? Wow. I have seen it over and over again. The Word of God does the convicting. Before I go on with this, I want to share something with you. One of the things that drove me to memorize verses the way I have is my dear loving Father. After I started memorizing Scripture, He took me visiting with them. Now these people were on the verge of getting saved. Their kids were coming to Awana Club. Back then it was good. And they were getting saved. And the, the people saw changes in their children and wanted the pastor, my dad, to come and talk to them. These were Presbyterians, Lutherans, and Catholics, and so on. And my dad said this. He said, David, he said, listen to the questions they ask. And ask yourself, what verses would you use to answer the questions? I was amazed at how much I thought I did know but didn't know. But then I was also amazed of how my dad Boom, 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 had chapter and verse, and these people were writing these things down. But not only that, they were being convicted. Yes. Not because of what my dad said, it's because of the Bible verses he used. You got that? And these people would write these things down. They would understand they get saved. They come to new Christians class. They get baptized. They join the church. I'd see them grow. And a couple of years later, here they are working vacation in Bible school, and some are becoming Sunday school teachers, and I'm thinking, Wow. Talk about wanting to drive your Bible and have answers. I wanted answers because I saw that it worked. And that's one of the things that literally changed my life. We'll talk more about this in the morning service and the basics of memorizing the scripture. But I want to share this with you how important this is. Now we're taking it to the next level. Souls were won by conviction of the Bible in the early New Testament church. Let me say that again. That's a mouthful. But I'm going to demonstrate here. This is very important. Souls were won by the conviction of the Bible in the early New Testament church. Now keep in mind, these disciples were trained by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. They went to Bible college for three and a half years under the Lord's supervision. And they had classroom experience where Jesus taught them, but then they had on-the-job experience where they went out and talked to people. But they saw the Lord in action. And saw him, have you not heard? Have you not read? And the Bible says this, the Bible says that. And they began to understand all this, and it all began to make sense. Because this is what happened. I'm going to give you a little walk through the book of Acts here. Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Now, this is the very first official meeting, you know, where they had the preaching and so on. It says, and they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added to him about 3,000 souls. Whose word did they receive? The word of God. Acts chapter 4, verse 4. Howbeit, many of them which heard the word believed. And the same day there was added to them about 5,000 souls. Wow. Acts chapter 6, verse 4. But we will give ourselves continue to prayer in the ministry of the word. Now, this is important because you look at the beginning of the chapter, it says, we are not, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God to serve tables, and they select the deacons. But this was an important decision. Notice what they said. We will give ourselves continued to prayer and the ministry of the word. Results, Acts 6, verse 7. And the word of God increased. And the number of disciples multitude greatly in Jerusalem. 
and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. Are you getting this? They saw the importance of sticking with the Bible and using the Word of God, and look what happened. Acts chapter 8, verse 35. This is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. And here he is out in the middle of nowhere teaching this guy. And it says in the same passage, he opened the scripture and began to preach unto him Jesus. What did he use to get this guy saved? The word of God. Evidently they did a good job because they not only learned how to be saved, but learned also about the importance of being baptized. And who knows what and all he taught him the time he had. But Philip knew his Bible. You know why God sent Philip out there in the middle of nowhere? Because Philip knew his Bible. Hint, 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 hint. Preacher man's always saying, get prepared and God will use you. Uh-huh. Acts chapter 16, this Philippian jailer story, verses 30 to 31, 32, I should say. And they brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. We stop right there. No, nope. the next verse is, and they spake unto them the word of the Lord, and to all in his household. Oh, he opened his Bible and showed them how to be saved. Acts 18, 28, Apollos. For he might have convinced the Jews and publicly showing them by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. I love this passage. This is one of these ones that you just quote. You've got to think on it a minute. He might have convinced who? The Jews. Keep in mind, most Jews back then were well educated. They went to the synagogue. They learned the scriptures. But they didn't understand that Jesus was the Christ. But this guy knew his Bible well enough that he convinced him by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. I like that. The Bible goes on to say in Acts 19, verse 20, so mighty grew the word of God and prevailed. All the way through the book of Acts, we see the success of the church growing and multiplying and multiplying as a result of somebody using the word of God. Are you getting this? Now point number three. There's only one interpretation of the scriptures. Oh, it got quiet in here. There's only one interpretation of the scriptures. Take your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1, please. This is another thing that drove me to memorize the Word of God. And I'll give an illustration why in just a minute here after we give you this passage. 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, now no prophecy of the Scripture is of what? Any private interpretation. For the prophets came not in the old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they're moved by the Holy Ghost. All right, so I'm going to pick on the Chase kids. Emily is away at college, right? All right. So, dear mom is at home right now recovering from a surgery, and she has a burden to write Emily because she misses her daughter. So she comes to other daughters and said, all right, girls, I want you to help me. Get out a piece of paper, and I want you to write this out for me. Dear Emily, we miss you very much. And both girls goes, oh, <laughs> I don't miss her. Oh, I'm so glad she's gone, man. This is nice, man. Oh, you're such a wonderful, sweet girl. Oh, <laughs> Bob, you don't know her like we do. And on and on they go, you know. And she just pouring it on, you know. But at the end, who signs the letter? The Chase girls? No. Mom does. Because who's the letter from? Mom. It's the same thing with the Bible. The disciples were told by God yeah. what to write. Amen. From the dot of the I to the cross of the T. It didn't matter what they thought or whether they believed it or not at the time. They wrote what God told them to write. And as a result, we have only one interpretation of the Bible. Back when I was, in, back when I was a boy, again, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, starting to memorize scripture, my dad was a pastor, wonderful guy, advertised on Sunday morning to come to the midweek service because this was your time to talk back to the preacher. I loved it because we got a lot of people come just to see what was going on, you know. But when they got there, they were very surprised because my dad would get up and he would make some profound statement. Sometimes it was true. Sometimes it was false. 
Sometimes it sounded like it was true. It had a half true in it or whatever, or sometimes, you know, whatever. But anyway, when he would get, get done, the people look at him like, well, pastor, we're not too sure on this. And he go, oh, you don't think I'm telling you the truth? Well, I'll tell you what, this is your time to talk back. You've got a Bible, Good. prove me wrong. Amen. Oh, I love that. He made us dig. He made us come up with answers. And sometimes he was a Jehovah Witness, sometimes a whoever. But anyway, we had, we had to come up with answers to refute what he was saying. And I'll tell you, he was a stinker because you'd answer one thing and he'd come up with more, you know, and make you dig some more. But I don't know about anybody else, but there was somebody sitting there got something out of there. It made me realize the importance of me knowing my Bible and being two steps ahead of who I was talking to and having answers. And at the end of each session, he would turn around and give us Bible versus ammunition for whatever we were talking about. And then go on and tell us how important it was to be prepared and how you use these Bible verses that the Word of God is a conviction and there's only one interpretation of the Bible. How many times have I heard through the years, especially at the prison, Oh, that's your interpretation. You ever heard that before? And I look at them and say, how can it be my interpretation when I'm only quoting the word of God? They had no answer. Because they thought if they said, well, that's your interpretation. That's what you believe. I said, no, this isn't just what I believe. I said, this is what the word of God has to say. They weren't used to that. They're used to the somebody believing what the religion says or Dr. So-and-so in the church says. And all I would say is, hey, this is the Bible. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen? Amen. Proverbs 30, verses 5 and 6. Every, not some, but every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him. Add thou not unto His words, lest thou reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Amen. That's pretty serious. Preacher man. Why do you quote so many Bible verses in your sermons? Are you trying to show off? No. The Bible has the answers, not me, folks. Amen. Good. I want you to see that this is what the Word of God says, not me. And I tell you what, it convicts. I've had this, my people tell my wife this and they tell me this. Preacher man, your sermons are very convicting. They're very powerful. What's your secret? Here it is. You got to use the right instrument, ladies and gentlemen. If you only get a hold of this, it put a fire on you. You say, wait a minute, the preacher man's got something here. We need to learn the word of God because it's what does the burning in the hearts, not me. Amen. Not me. It's so important. Acts 20, 27, Paul's pouring his heart out here. He said, for I have not shunned to pre preach unto you the whole counsel of God. Paul taught everything he could according to the Bible. Proverbs 22, verses 20, 21 says this. Have not I written unto thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee to know the certainty of the words of the truth, that thou mightest answer words of truth unto them that are sent unto thee. Notice the word answer in there. It's not just giving an answer. It's giving a definite answer. 1 Peter 3, 15, this is the banner we have on our banner. We don't have it with us so we can see you folks from the back table a little more this time. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give what? An answer. To every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. One of the reasons why I memorize scripture is because the Bible has definite answers. I love it. They can't be refuted. And when you talk to somebody that thinks they have so much knowledge and you can shut them up with just one Bible verse, I'll tell you what, it's downright fun. But also it shows you how powerful the Word of God really is. Amen. Yes, I remember this like yesterday. I was working at the prison and the Gulf War broke out. And everybody was in a big panic. The inmates were all coming up saying, Preacher man, preacher man, aren't you afraid? It looks, this is the battle of Armageddon. This is it, this is it. And, and all the officers, oh, preacher man, man, preacher man, man, yeah, you better get everything in right, man. This is it, the, the battle of Armageddon's going on. I started laughing at them. I said, what's so funny? I said, we haven't gotten past Revelation chapter three yet. And they go, huh? Oh man, did I have some Bible studies. It was fun. But they didn't realize there was only one interpretation of the Bible. 
They didn't realize the book of Revelation was so easy to understand. Take your Bible to Revelation chapter 1 a minute. I want to show you something. Well, I'm about ready to show you. There are pastors and doctors, teachers out there who have doctor's degrees that have never seen this before or understood this. You ready? Revelation 1, 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which will be hereafter. You know what you're looking at? You're looking at the outline of Revelation. You say, preacher man, how do you know this? Because the Bible tells me so. Revelation 1 verse 11, I am Alpha and Omega, first and last. What thou seest, write in a book. Chapter 1 is the thing which thou hast seen. What thou seest, write in a book, and send it to the seven churches, which are, present tense, in Asia. Unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardius, unto Philadelphia, unto Laodicea. Chapters 2 and 3 are the things which are. The things which must be after, hereafter, is chapters 4 through 22. Chapter 4, verse 10. After these things, I behold an open door in heaven. The first voice would talk me forth with a trumpet, saying, Come up hither, for I must show you the things which must be hereafter. You say, that's pretty easy. Yeah, it is. And you'd be surprised the reaction I get, how the mouths drop open, because they'd never seen this before. You say, this seems pretty simple. It is once you understand the book of Revelation. Now, I'm not going to go through a whole lesson on prophecy, but I, what I want to do is just give this as an illustration how simple the Word of God is to understand if we'd only take the time out to study to show ourselves a fruit unto God. Yep. It's more than just reading a Bible and just saying, when we're done. No, you meditate upon it. You think about it. You ask yourself, what does this mean? You talk about it. And right here, you have the whole outline of Revelation right in front of you. It just stuns me. I, I asked them, what is the outline of Revelation? They said, there's many. I said, no, what is the outline of Revelation? They never heard this before. Yeah. Now, I got time. I got to throw one more thing at you. This is kind of fun. I give them. <laughs> the 144,000. Revelation 14, 4 is talked about them. It says, these are they that defile themselves. These are they that not defile themselves with women for their virgins. These are they, the Father, the Lamb, where this will be going. These are the redeemed, the first fruits of God unto the Lamb. And I ask this question. How can these be the first fruits of God unto the Lamb? When the Bible says in John 15, 16, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you to go and bring forth fruit. We've been bringing forth fruit now for over 2,000 years. How can be they, these be the first fruits of the God unto the Lamb? And they're stunned. They have no answer. You know what the answer is? These are the first fruits of the tribulation period. These are the 144,000, the results of the two witnesses' ministry, the ones that go out and evangelize the world during the tribulation period. You say, wow, isn't this cool? Amen. It's getting quiet here. Yes. I hope you're taking notes. I mean, if you want more, i got a whole book on this stuff. But I, I'm not, again, I'm not here to teach all this prophecy, but I'm giving this, because this is Berea Baptist Church. You guys are kind of theologians. But I just want to show you how important it is to know your Bible. Because yes. there are so many false doctrines out there and brainwashing even people that ought to know better and pastors that ought to know better. And then I come along, the preacher man asks these questions. They look at me like, huh? I never thought of that before. You know why? They don't know these things. We don't know our Bibles like we're supposed to, folks. Yes. That's why I tell you, the Bible says we're supposed to study to show ourselves a prudent unto who? God. A work needed not to be ashamed, rightly divided the word of truth. When I was in junior high, I started witnessing. In high school, I started dealing with Pentecostals and Jehovah Witnesses and so on. And I come home and tell my dad about this. And you know what he said? You got a Bible. Go find the answers. Boy, I say, he's got his nerve, doesn't he? That's one of the best things he ever told me, amen? Now, he was there if I needed him by getting prepared that way. But I had to dig to be two steps ahead of them. Two steps ahead. And it paid off. I was dealing with what we, we were called the big three in high school. And after school, we had what they call a roundtable discussion because the cafeteria had roundtables. 
So it was me, a Jehovah Witness, and a Pentecostal. The Pentecostal's name was Jim Monroe, so we called it the Monroe Doctrine. <laughs> Believe me, it fit. This guy was something else. I could teach a whole message on him alone. But I had to refute him and at the same time have ammunition to refute the Jehovah Witness. Well, the Jehovah Witness just so happened to ride my bus home. One night, we were riding the bus home, and we sat right behind the bus driver. And we're having this discussion, and he's asking me all these questions. The guy's getting close to being saved, you know, so he's asking all these questions and doubting the Jehovah Witness religion, and I'm firing all these verses at him. And all of a sudden, the bus driver reaches over and turns the radio off. This is public school. And everybody says, what'd you do that for? The bus driver says, because I want to hear this. This is getting interesting. <laughs> so the whole bus is listening to this conversation between the Jehovah Witness. He gets off. For the next 20 minutes, I'm not, this is not, this is the truth. For the next 20 minutes, the bus driver had me get up. I had to stand up and everybody raised their hand and I answered Bible questions. <laughs> like, why does your dad not serve wine at the communion service? And all, all kinds of stuff. But I had chapter and verse for every one of them because that's what I was taught. And all I could think about was, thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. But you know what else it did? It made me go back to my Bible and get more prepared and more prepared and more prepared. Little did I know that someday, as you'll find out tonight, I had to work in a prison for 18 years, 18 and a half, and had to deal with Muslim, devil worshipers, Jehovah Witnesses, agnostics, and I had to be two steps ahead of them. I had to have answers. How did he get all these answers? Remember, I was the guy that was supposed to finish high school. I was X'd off. I was supposed to be stupid. But see, the word of God's got answers. Yes, and I found out that if you learn them and you only have learned that the Bible is one interpretation to find out what it is and it can't be refuted, it shuts everybody up, it convicts the hearts of people got saved. By the way, that Jehovah Witness got saved. I've got his Bible in my heresy file. <laughs> but I tell you, it's worth it. Are you getting the point across? I'm sharing my heart with you, preparing you for the morning service, but also I've got the cream of the crop here. You people have been here, some of you for years, you've been learning your Bible. Some of you say when you were young, some of you kids are going to the academy here. I want a question, I, I want a question for you kids. How serious are you taking your Bible lessons? Are you just learning them for a test? So you could pass it and say, okay, what's next? You don't realize what you got. I got a couple of minutes left. Let me say, this is important. We have a preaching conference every year at our church. And we have, usually have a back table up, you know. And I, my wife's my witness. We have kids walk by from the academy and say, oh, I don't need this stuff. We get this in school. College students, I don't need this stuff. I'm getting it in school. And then they graduate. Then they go out and they get a church or a mission field. And all of a sudden, they're stopping by the back table. Preacher man... I need this stuff. Yeah. Amen. You see, they thought they were it because they got good grades in school. They thought they were it because they were who's who in America if they got an award like that. But all they were doing was passing things for a test and then they got out in real, real life and realized that they need real answers and they had to have a chapter and verse for everything and, 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 and their doctor professor was not there. Are you listening, teenagers? One of these days, Brother Chase won't be there. One of these days, Brother Rogers won't be here. One of these days, Brother Cook won't be there. You're going to be out on your own. Right. Ask Sarah Glover. She'll tell you. Okay? She goes to the mission field. She can't call every five minutes. Hello, Pastor Rogers, can you help me? No. You've got to have answers. Are you getting this? I would have given my right arm to have the education you're getting. I didn't get to Christian school to my senior year in high school. I just thank the Lord for the biblical ed education I got from my dad. But I, I'm, I'm pouring my heart out to you teenagers because you're in here to help you realize that you need to study not just for your test, but to prove unto God. Because you're going to need this stuff. Someday you're going to be out on your own. Hopefully some of you are going to be called somewhere to a mission field or whatever. And you're going to be talking to people. Amen. And you're going to have to have answers. Yes, Something to think about, isn't it? Because this is what changed my life. This is what turned me around and made me start memorizing. It's so, so important. Now, in closing, take your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. 
I've told you all this, but now I want to show you the Bible's warning, not just mine. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Take heed unto thyself, into the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt save thyself and them that hear thee. Wow. Here's a warning from God's word. We are commanded to keep God's word. Titus 2 verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Hebrews 2 verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the most earnest heed to the things that we have heard, lest at any time we let them slip. Acts 17 11. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, that they received with the word would all read into some mind and search the scriptures daily whether these things were so. These are not my words, folks. This is a warning from the Word of God saying, hey, make sure you're on the same track as the Bible. Make sure this is what the Word of God has to say. Make sure it's in the context. Dealing with false doctrine all the time. Most of the time what's happened is they've taken one verse out of context, like I talked about with the suspenders with your belt. And it, they ignore the rest of the past. It explains everything. I, I've dealt with that many, many, but especially the Muslim. But it's fun with them. But anyway, I'm telling you, this is what this, all, that's what you need to do, is do a little studying. Just don't read, but take some time out to think and ask yourself, why was this written? Who was this written to? Who's doing the talking? Who, uh, who wrote it? And what time period is involved? All these are important when you consider these things. But it pays off after a while, folks. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That verse, little did I know what I memorized, and I, just, I was just like you, I memorized it for an Awana verse, so I could pass a section. Little did I know it would be one of the most valuable verses I'd ever learned in my life, because it's so important. You see, because it says a workman needed not to be ashamed. How many times have you stayed home from visitation because you were afraid someone was going to ask you a question that you couldn't answer? Ouch. Don't feel bad. I get this all over America. It's amazing. This is one of the main reasons why people don't want to go visiting. They're afraid someone's going to ask a question they can't answer. Well, why don't you change that? Amen. I used to be the same way. <laughs> I didn't want to say a word because I was supposed to be jughead. I was supposed to be stupid. But my dad changed all that. He said, what would you answer? And convicted me. He didn't make me memorize anything. He convicted me just by saying, hey, this is how it's done. You can get prepared. Yeah, I'm so glad he did. How about it, my friends? Rightly divided in the word of God. And now maybe you've got in your minds another reason why the preacher man comes here every year and drives into your head about why you need to be memorizing verses. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get ready for the morning service. Oh, Heavenly Father, I've done what you've asked me to do. I pour my heart out to these people and I ask, Lord, that your word does the convicting, not me. Pray they might think about this and prepare your heart, their hearts, Lord, for the morning service also. In Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. All right, amen. We're going to be dismissed at this time and uh, be back in here in a couple minutes for the morning service. Amen. <clears throat>